Thanks for having this paper on the program. It's a recent paper on international trade. It's joint work with two of my Princeton colleagues. Danny Kleinman is actually a student at Princeton. We're going to study, study international friends and enemies using a trade representation. So the broad motivation of this paper is um, the world has seen rapid economic growth in China, especially China, but also other emerging economies over the last few decades, and in particular relative size or relative economics, uh, economic influence of different countries have changed drastically over the last few decades. A classic question in trade is what are the effects of such drastic economic growth in one country on the income and welfare and its trading partners? And a related question in uh, political economy is whether such changes in economic sizes heighten political tension. So a good analogy would be, you know, as China grow, it has spillover over effects through trade linkages on all the trading partners directly or indirectly. And perhaps that affects how sort of US views China, how Japan views China and so on. Okay. This term Tutsiditis trap is coined by Alison Grant using to describe the situation where one, when one rising power threatens the position of a pre-existing power, war is kind of inevitable. So this term is used to describe the uh, Athens-Sparta war in ancient Greece, but you know, there might be some uh, parallel in the current US-China tension. So we are motivated by these questions and we're going to use a trade framework. And in particular, we're going to build both the new theory and evidence on these questions. So on the trade front, we're going to develop a bilateral sufficient statistic measure, what we call friends and enemy representation to capture how one country's income and welfare is exposed to the productivity improvements in another country. Okay, these will be sufficient statistics that can be computed directly using observed trade flows. Now, for the audience that's familiar with trade, you might ask, well, trade models can already do that, right? Classic, or um, right now, the quantitative trade models, for instance, Eden Corden, or the various extensions, you can essentially use observed trade flows to compute welfare counterfactuals. So those models enables you to use trade flow and feeding the trade elasticity and calculate welfare effect of every other country following a vector of productivity shock anywhere in the world. So what do we bring to the table? What we do is essentially take the system equation that the leading class of trade models all use and we linearize it. In the linearization, we show that it's particularly simple. It's a couple of matrices that are directly derived from trade flows. And these matrices reveal underlying economic mechanisms behind how, um, behind the global income and welfare exposure to each other through trade and general equilibrium linkages. Now, because these are linearizations, they're exact for small shocks in the leading class of trade models characterized by a constant trade elasticity. However, we also show both analytically and quantitatively that our linearization is almost exact. And I'm going to show some math results for why that's the case. It's a property of global trade matrix such that basically our linearization is almost the exact solution. The two are almost indistinguishable. Now, because it's a linearization and it's based on matrices, it's computationally trivial. So existing trade models, you can, if you have a particular counterfactual question. So given the trade flow of 2012, 1% productivity improvement in China, how does that affect US or Japan? You can calculate using traditional methods. But because our, of our computational advantage, we are, our method is about 70,000 times faster than traditional methods. So we can compute actually millions and millions of counterfactuals in, in a matter of seconds on laptop computer. And in fact, we are going to compute this global bilateral uh, welfare exposure. So 140 by 140 countries, over 42 years, and we're going to decompose into various effects. So how important is Singapore in shaping the welfare exposure between US and China? How important are the car industries in shaping that welfare exposure? How important are regional production chains and so on? So because of interpretability and computational properties, we can do all of that kind of factors. So okay. Ernest. And Ernest, this set of formula that- I yep. have a question, Ernest? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so you mentioned about the economic size, but here you are you are talking about uh, each economist exposure to other economists' productivity shock. So so the okay. so the relative size is not part of your welfare function directly, right? Um, I I will I will be very specific in a couple of slides, but basically we're thinking of we're doing we're not doing a normative question. We don't have a social welfare uh, function. What we do is describing. Say China has a productivity gain of one percent. Mm -hmm. How does that affect income and welfare in every other country? And what are the channels through which other countries are affected? If okay. politicians in a country care about their relative standing in the world, then perhaps mm -hmm. to turn this welfare exposure into political exposure, you need to think about you know the relative welfare exposure across all other trade partners and so on. That we don't model, but the methodology enables you to do that. Okay. So uh, the set of formulas I'm going to show has the same representation across a large class of trade trade uh, trade models, Eden Corden or the multi-sector input out linkage extensions, as well as models with economic geography. Okay. So what so we do exactly I is have, we calculate. So I have I have a question. Is it correct here basically to say that what you're doing is a kind of a reduced form of the political economy of trade? That is that uh, in the sense, you know, uh, 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 then, then you have, you know, one economy is kind of, you know, uh, uh, relatively progressing and then you have lobbying, you know, uh, on the uh, import side, on the export side, etc. And then, as a consequence, you see, you know, basically some correlations of, of trades. Uh, uh, and and so, so is, is this a correct way of, of basically saying what you're doing? So the main contribution of the paper will be a methodological contribution to the trade literature. In that existing work or existing methodology allow you to compute this counterfactual. So... U.S. wants to know how important is China productivity for U.S. Existing models can answer that. But the existing methodology is kind of like a black box, whereas we will have matrices and vectors that show you exactly what are the mechanisms, what are the channels, which are the markets and industries that are important for these exposures. And because of computational properties, we can do this at a large scale. Okay, That's the methodological contribution to trade. Now, we do have a sort of more um, spicy part of the paper where we relate this bilateral exposure, wealth exposure to productivity shock to political outcomes. That's more of a reduced form approach. We are not writing down social welfare functions. We're not writing down a lobbying process. We're just going to look at bilateral relations measured by some, you know, how countries vote in the UN or how international relationship scholars um, indicated whether countries are in rivalries. We want to understand in a reduced form way, how do those outcomes relate to trade? And we're going to construct an in instrument variable for that. But let me get to that after describing the trade and methodological part. So what we do really is we compute the first order effect of a productivity shock in a given country on a welfare in each of the other countries, okay? So think of it as Chinese productivity improvement, how does that affect US welfare? To answer that, you need global trade matrix, which is essentially a, trade, a matrix of trade flows. And we're going to derive based on that trade flow matrix into several forms. And together they shape this bilateral exposure. First is expenditure share. So how does uh, each importer spends uh, its income on the various exporters. So how does US or Singapore or Canadian consumers, how much do they spend on Japanese goods? How much do they spend on Chinese goods and so on? The second is the income share matrix. So for each exporter, what fraction of its income is derived from selling to each of these markets or each of these importers? And the third is the cross substitution matrix, which is essentially the product between the first two matrices. So cross substitution is a matrix that captures how does cha uh, changing competitiveness in one country affects global demand for goods produced by another country. So think of US-China, okay? 
Ch Chinese goods gets more uh, gets cheaper because uh, China becomes more productive. Now, consumers around the globe will start buying more Chinese goods and buying less U.S. goods. Okay, so consumers in Singapore will buy more Chinese goods. Consumers in Canada will buy more Chinese goods and all less U.S. goods. Same is true for goods produced by any other country. That will affect their income, affect factor prices, and the factor prices will then feed in into the good, the price of the goods. So that's that's essentially how general equilibrium is a fixed point of the partial equilibrium forces. And this cross substitution matrix captures exactly the partial equilibrium part of it. All of these are based on observed trade flows. So we're going to use this matrix representation to reveal underlying economic mechanisms. So, so we're going to show yeah. that income exposure. Uh, yep, Michael. So, uh, I feel like uh, income share is just a flip side of expenditure share. Uh, so if uh, if you have expenditure share and uh, you have a size of an economy, right, then you have income share. So why do you want to uh, want us to think about these two things separately? Uh, they, all of these can be derived, uh, any of these can be derived from any uh, of the other. So from trade flow, you can get expenditure income across substitution. From expenditure share, you can also get income share and so on. So. You can think of a global trade matrix as a graph. If you normalize the graph by some way, like by the, in by the income of exporters or by the income of importers, then depending on how you normalize, it becomes one or the other expenditure share or income share matrix. These are all sort of similar Markov chains uh, in, in terms of the general equilibrium forces. The, the reason we separate them is because precisely these matrices could that relationship I just described, that the, the one that you just conjectured, could break down when there are trading balances, for example. And when there are trade, you know, under trading balance, that relationship no longer holds. And what captures the underlying economic forces, we think, is the precise label that we created for these. That's why we separate them conceptually. But you're right, they, are, they can all be derived just based on global trade flows. Okay. okay. So we're going to use this matrix representation to reveal underlying economic mechanisms. So income exposure, say, how does Chinese productivity affect U.S. income? Well, first of all, Chinese productivity gain caused global consumers to shift away or to buy more Chinese goods and less U.S. goods. U.S. income will be lower, factor prices will be lower, so the goods produced by the U.S. will become lower. That in turn feeds into this general equilibrium, and the income exposure is the fixed point of that. Welfare exposure of a country. So welfare of U.S. depends on U.S. income and the cost of living in the U.S. So Chinese productivity affects U.S. welfare in two ways. Chinese productivity could cause U.S. income to decrease, but through cheaper goods, through cheaper Chinese imports, that could actually benefit U.S. welfare. So that's the welfare exposure part. We can also decompose it into partial equilibrium versus general equilibrium terms. And because of the entire sort of the entire methodology is linear algebra, everything is additively separable. So you can think of, you know, contribution coming from individual economic sectors, contribution from individual markets, how important is Singapore in shaping US China exposure and so on. Okay. So the presentation will have two parts. The first half, I'm going to derive these methodologies and hopefully convince you that they are very transparent and they're kind of useful. And second part, I will be showing you mostly various plots of applying these tools to filter through this giant matrix of trade flow over time and see how global trade relationship has changed over time and show you some counterfactuals. If Chinese productivity gain, which sectors in which countries benefit, which country and sectors are important in shaping Chinese U.S. exposure and so on. Okay, that's the application part. I'm also going to show you some theoretical and simulation result that our, our approximation, first order effect, is essentially the full nonlinear effect. And finally, uh, we're going to use political data, uh, how countries vote in the United Nations, and how whether countries are engaging strategic rivalries. So we're going to use those measures to show that as countries become greater economic friends, they also tend to become greater political friends. Okay, that would be the last part of the talk. So let me first give an overview of uh, using an Armington setting. What is an Armington model? Okay, that's essentially capturing all, you know, Eden Corridum, uh, Calendo Perro, and all those models are Armington models. What are they? Well, there are N countries in the world, 
each country has an exogenous supply of productive factors, call them labor. And each country produces a single good. So there's a productivity that turns the stock of labor into the good. Okay, so country I produce good I. And consumers around the world has a preference for varieties. That's why they trade. That's an Armington model. So throughout the talk, N will be the, in, N will be the importer and I will be the exporter. Okay, so Armington model specifies a level of variety preferences of consumers in each country. So consumer in country N, their utility is exactly equal to their income divided by some cost of living or price index. The price index will depend on the entire vector of prices for each of the goods that they buy. And the price of good I sold in country N is exactly equal to the, the factor price of country I divided by the productivity in country I multiplied by some iceberg trade cost. Okay, that's how prices are specified in our models. Now, given this indirect utility function, so if you give me a set of preferences for these consumers, I can tell you exactly what the price index uh, cursive P would look like. Based on that, we can, de we can derive some expenditure share function. So how, how much does consumer in country I spend on each good depends on the vector of prices as well. And the, equi the equilibrium is closed by a set of market clearing conditions saying the total income earned by exporter I is the sum of goods that I sells to each of the other countries. So this is the system equation that defines equilibrium in any Armington model. Okay, now the name of the game now is to understand how does income or welfare change in response to productivity shocks around the world. So what we do is we just di differentiate or total differentiate the system of the equation. What we obtain is the following. Okay, this may seem complicated, but actually it's extremely simple. So follow me in interpreting each of the terms. So let's first think of H as an index for China, okay? China has a productivity gain, so there's a gain in ZH that lowers Chinese prices, lowers Chinese costs. So in every market around the globe, in Singapore, in Canada, in Mexico, consumers in all of these parts will shift away their demand from the US towards China. The extent to which they change their demand is captured by these cross price elasticities. So theta and IK is the demand of consumer I, uh, consumer N on good I with respect to change in price of good H, okay? So each market N, so N, the index N captures for all the markets that US and China competes in. So there's Singapore, Canada, and so on. And in each of these markets, consumers shift away from US goods into towards Chinese goods. What's the impact on US income? That depends on the importance of each of the market for US. So that's captured by the income share of each market for the US. And the total effect um, is the left-hand side. The, how you get US income changes is an aggregation of all of these substitution. But that's the partial equilibrium, okay? So d log z times all these other terms, that's the partial equilibrium effect. The general equilibrium part comes from the fact that if US income changes or if Canadian income changes, Factor prices in these countries will adjust. Cost of goods sold by these countries will also change. And again, feed into the substitution effect. And the third term here at the very beginning captures the market size effect. So if Singapore buys a lot from the US and Singapore income suddenly declines, that's a negative impact on US income as well. Okay, so the total general equilibrium effect of any productivity shock on income of other countries is just the fixed point of the system equation. And you know, if you give me a preferences, I can solve for, derive for the cross price elasticities, and we can use this equation to figure out what's the well income exposure. In terms of welfare exposure, it's simpler. So the welfare of country N is increasing in the income of country N and is decreasing in the cost of living. So as goods become cheaper, consumers actually benefit. And cost of living depends on, um, cost, total cost of living is a, is a weighted sum where the weights are the expenditure shares on the prices of imports from different exporters. 
That's for general Armington model. Now, in trade, people like to work with uh, CES models. So think of Eden Corridor, think of uh, where you know, technological differences are drawn from Frechet distribution, or you can specify a CES utility function. In that case, these cross price elasticities will just collapse down to the trade elasticity. So in, in a model with a constant trade elasticity, these, these expressions are even simpler. And this data is no longer a reduced form object. It stays invariant to allocations. So we can stack these equations into a matrix form. And that, that is our key representation, the friends and enemy representation. Okay. So th what this is saying is a vector of productivity shock around the world will cause some substitution effects. That's the partial equilibrium effect. Holding factor prices constant, only changing, pr changing prices only due to changing productivity, how does that affect global demand for each other's goods? That directly affects income. Changing income will then affect, fact affect factor prices, which will feed into the cross substitution. And also changing income will directly affect the income of each other. In the earlier language, when Singapore becomes poorer, Singapore will buy less from the US that directly affects US. Okay? So the general equilibrium effect of uh, cross country income exposure is just a fixed point of that. You can rearrange the term and do a matrix inversion to get the general equilibrium. Ernest. For Ernest, welfare. Ernest, yep. Can, can, you, can you do the non homothetic preferences? And so do you, do you, do you need um, a, a homothetic assumption here? Um, no, because as long as you have this representation, this set of equation is valid. Well, this set of equation is always valid. Um, right, but but your utility your utility is basically linear right now, right? So the UN is just the real wage. Uh, suppose right, I'm, I'm know, think, so so that's okay. Um, but I'm thinking about suppose you have multiple sectors, and mm -hmm. I'm having non homothetic preferences about uh, expenditure shares on on, di on how I spend on different goods in different sectors. Yep. So whether that's uh, I mean, theoretically, you will be fine. I'm just thinking about the quantitative, whether the approximation will still be good yeah. when you have a normal statistic. Yep. So, so there, 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 there is some, so based on what I've, I'm showing you here mm -hmm. and a non-homothetic non multi-sector model, there are a couple mm -hmm. of jumps. First is we're going to extend this from a single sector model to multi-sector. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's quite standard in trade. Almost nothing right. would change. Yeah. Second, we're going to extend from a CES model to one with no CES preferences, but still homothetic. We are going mm -hmm. to have some analytic result to characterize how sensitive is the prediction from departures from CES within a non-homothetic world. Third, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, uh, within a non-CES world, but still homothetic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Third, if you go full non-homothetic, non then if you tell me what the preferences are, and if I observe all the allocation to plug in, I can still apply the formulas because the formulas are just first order approximations. Right, we right. We cannot assess is, the quality of, of approximation. Right, so the question is how, how, how good approximation is when you have non-homothetic. Well, if you say preferences are general without any restrictions, we cannot answer how good approximation is because mm -hmm. how good approximation depends on the specification of preferences. So we can say within CES, it's almost exact. Within homothetic, we can tell you exactly how good it does. It's not exact, but it's pretty good. Away from homothetic, you have to tell me a class of preferences. For example, for example, for example, suppose suppose it's a non homothetic CES. You know the you know you know these are non homothetic CES preferences. But the income mm -hmm. elasticity varies, but the elasticity of substitution is the same. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't know the answer. answer. We haven't yeah. worked that. Okay. All right. There's, there, there's a question from uh, uh, Lu Tan. Tan. Please, Ernest, can I ask a uh, verification question? Yep. So, uh, if I use standard trade model, as you said, is CS, my understanding is every country is going to gain from every other country's technology shock, right? Is that right? 
No, that's actually incorrect. So in a two country world, both countries benefit from each other's productivity gain. Right. In a multi country world, that's not necessarily true. Even because countries sorry, even the trade elasticity is the same and constant across countries. So in a in a within the class of co constant trade elasticity models, right, there's standard Armington. This multi-industry version, there's Inpadapa version, and so on. I'm not sure if you can derive. I depending on the configuration of trade cost, I think the answer is generically no. So this matrix of welfare exposures will not always be positive. Some entries will be negative. Some countries will get hurt by Chinese growth. Not every country will gain. The world as a whole should gain on average. Not every country will gain. Right, so suppose there's no trade cost at all. Think about the frictionless world. Does the statement... Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Because if you think of, you know, think of a multi-industry version of, of, of Armington, where two countries produce exactly the same good and don't produce any other good, then, that, you know, I then... then yeah, that I agree. I'm thinking about the ACR... Oh, simple in the EK framework. In the EK framework, I saw every country gonna gain no. the productive. No, no, no. So that's not true. We, yeah, our, our baseline is exactly the EK, and in general, we are ACR plus. But generically, the matrix of global trade exposure is not always positive. Right, so then the critical deviation from the standard, say like, is that the multiple industries on the preferences, uh, which one is more important? No, I'm, I, I'm saying even within the ACR class, even within Eden Corden, it's not always true that every country in the world would benefit in welfare from Chinese growth. Okay, good. Right. I mean, so, so, it's a, so we don't need any three country effect, right? So it's a standard three country effect, so trade diversions. So it's like when, when, when they think about the opposite, so when, when China is uh, having the getting a tariff from US, then the VLAN will benefit. And it so so generically, these forces come about when yeah. a country and China sell the same things to exactly. the same set of destinations. Mm -hmm. That's when the country will get hurt by Chinese growth. But I saw the general... So intuitively... I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand yeah, it. Yes. In the EK formula, without multiple sector, I saw the general equilibrium effect always dominates. But maybe I'm, no. I, I need to check. No, and uh, that's exactly the baseline result we have. About 90% of entries are positive, 10%, 5, 5 to 10% are negative. That's, it's not always positive. Okay. okay. We can theoretically show it's not always positive. Okay. Uh, well, I, I, think, I think generally trade literature feel, you know, first of all, productivity gains are not zero sum. So on average, the world has to gain. I think in an older, theoretically focused literature, people have come up with examples of countries getting hurt by other countries' growth. In EK models, I don't think it's been analyzed systematically. What are the cases where uh, countries get hurt? We don't do that systematic um, analysis here. Based on my understanding of the property of the model, if a country in China ship the same uh, goods, or in the a, in a EK model, they all produce the same goods. So if a if a country in China ships to the same country, so they compete in the same market, it's more likely that the country gets hurt by Chinese growth. Okay. So what is, what is this uh, M matrix? M is essentially the product between T and S, okay? So forget about the identity term. Think of, think of you know, Chinese growth, how does that affect the US? Well, US derives income from Singapore, Canada, and Mexico, Canada, Singapore, Mexico all shift uh, their expenditure towards China. And the total effect of China on US is the shifting of these countries weighted by US income share derived from these countries and sum up. That's why it's a, it's a matrix multiplication between T and S, okay? So we can reformulate these uh, vector equations into matrix form. An entry of this matrix, this is an N by N matrix, an entry of that matrix would capture the effect on welfare or on income coming from productivity shock of another. And one can do various sorts of decomposition just because the linear algebra property. 
one can look at contribution of individual country, contribution of individual sector in the multi-sector extension of these formulas. One can look at partial and general equilibrium forces. So for example, in terms of income exposure, you know, um, M captures the partial equilibrium effects and general equilibrium is an Leontief inverse in front of that. So the Leontief inverse is, uh, can be written as a Newman or power series and partial equilibrium is the first term, all higher terms are general equilibrium forces. Exactly the intuition I said. M captures the extent to which consumers shift away from each, other, each country and towards China but income changes feed into this effect and keep, keeps going. That's the general equilibrium, okay? So we do various sorts of extensions in the paper, um, various extensions to this quantitative trade literature, including multi-industry, multi-input uh, upper table, including econ geography with migration, different types of consumer, multiple types of consumer within country, departure from cost and trade elasticity, trading balance, we look at trade cost changes and so on. So I'm, I'm going to provide you some quick intuition for the multi-industry case and move on to the data. So for um, multi-industry, the set of formulas is essentially the same. T is again the income share, S is again the expenditure share, and M is some notion of cross-substitution, except the following difference. In a world where every country produces uh, one, one single good, a market is a third country. So US and China, US goods and Chinese goods compete in Singapore, okay? In a multi-industry extension, US labor and Chinese labor compete in Singapore's car industry, in Malaysia's textile industry, and so on. So a market is no longer a third country, but it's instead a country industry pair. So this N matrix is essentially summing up US and China exposure to each market or country industry and some, some across them to get total US-China substitution exposure. But the generic, the form of generic equilibrium propagation is exactly the same, okay? So we're gonna use um, trade data, uh, 42 years, 140 countries. We're gonna augment that with population and distance and income data in order to estimate some form of gravity, which will be used in some of the applications. And um, here, here's the set of applications that we, we have in mind to show you. First, we're gonna show you the quality of approximation and walk through the intuition for why this first order approximation is basically the exact nonlinear solution to what's called the head algebra in trade, okay? Second, we're going to use the linear, uh, linear form of these formulas to do lots of descriptive analysis. So we are going to look at impact of Chinese growth on US welfare income and on other countries. We're going to isolate the mechanism to separate uh, into different forces. We're going to look at how, well, how important is each third market how important is each industry in shaping US-China exposure? We're gonna look at how sort of um, Chinese growth would affect commodity rich countries versus countries that are integrated with China in the regional production chain, where in, in, in implementing that part of the exercise, we're gonna use the input up version of these formulas. And uh, finally, we're gonna show you how over time changes in bilateral economic exposure correlates with a political exposures. Okay, first on quality of approximation. So I don't have time to go into the detail, but essentially what we do is we feed in random productivity shocks and measure income exposure using our first order formula and plot the predicted income exposure using the nonlinear formulas. We try all kinds of productivity vectors, reasonable scale, gigantic scale, realistic productivity distribution, and so on. When we plot them against each other, it's always a 45 degree line, okay? When we first saw it, we thought we made a coding error. We checked and checked and checked and discovered that it's a robust property. That is, um, the trig literature uses a set of nonlinear equations to compute these uh, counterfactuals. How does productivity shock affect welfare and income among others? These nonlinear equations are essentially linear, essentially have a log linear form, the one that I showed you. So another kind of evidence is if we plot our predicted welfare exposure on the full solution from the nonlinear model, 
if we regress one another, regression coefficient is almost uh, one, and the correlation is always above 0.9999. Okay, essentially, they, they coincide. What's the intuition for it? So this is the set of actual head algebra, right? the nonlinear non set of equation that uh, trade economists use in computing welfare or income counterfactual from productivity shocks. This is our linearization. And our linearization differs from the true nonlinear solution with some second order term and higher order term and so on. Okay. We, we can show that the, eigenva uh, the eigenvalue or the, the norm of these hashing matrix, which captures the size of the second order term, can be used to bound all of these higher order terms. And the eigenvalue is basically zero. Okay, what's the intuition for that? These two equations coincide exactly if all countries are in autarky, if there's, or if there's no trade costs around the world. So uh, every country's expenditure share across all exporters is the same. And the real world trade matrix is just a weighted average of those. So real world trade matrix is an identity matrix plus a weighted, a weight, a plus a weighted version of the free trade expenditure share matrix plus some noise. Why? Because in trade, you know, the gravity equation really uh, predicts trade flow really well. So gravity equation says there's distance, there's importer, and there's exporter effects. Here we're looking at expansion share, so, so importer effects is taken care of. The exporter effect is essentially the, 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 the size of each country in the free trade, in the free trade version of the expansion share matrix. And finally, distance across bilateral pairs because the world is a sphere, those distance is essentially some noise that gets washed out. So you can think of, you know, global trade matrix is a weighted average of some noise, free trade matrix and identity. And because of that, the Hessians have the property that eigenvalue is almost zero. And we calculate that analytically and show it in the data. Okay, now we're going to apply the tools to actual trade data to show you, um, to show you some patterns over time. So yes, we're we just calculating. Let me let me just uh, uh, ask one more thing about this approximation. So, under what kind of circumstances approximation would fail dramatically? So, in that case, there's some countries in the world they have uh, uh, unusually high trade costs. So, some countries are kind of close to free trade, and uh, a set of uh, countries are far away from that world. No, it, it, it's not about it's not about changing a row of the matrix. You have to change the entire matrix itself. So some country following free trade that doesn't help with approximation. It has to be that the entire matrix kind of looks like free trade, which is basically saying the size of the exporter really predicts the expenditure share matrix, which is true. So the kind of trade relationship that would break this approximation is the following: if country one only buys from country two. Country two only buys from country three, three only buys from four, and so on. Then the approximation would be, you know, not as good. It would just be typical first order approximation. It wouldn't be this magical approximation that's equal to the nonlinear solution. I see. So in some sense, you need to have some kind of uh, asymmetric kind of uh, uh, trade costs uh, uh, connecting uh, countries. So it's not like you know what I said. A group of uh, countries uh, free trading and another group of countries uh, 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 separate. You need to have uh, some kind of weird uh, uh, trade costs uh, among these countries. Um, so you, you need to have some strange arrangement of the trade costs, which you don't see from the real world trade flows in order to break the approximation. So we can only say that approximation is great on real world trade flows and we show some properties of it. We can construct counterfactual trade flows such that approximation uh, breaks down, but um, that's not uh, relevant for the empirical application though. Okay, so this picture basically shows you sort of the global welfare exposure, uh, the average welfare exposure across countries over time, you know, in line with increasing globalization, on average countries benefit more from each other's productivity growth, this shows the distribution of that. So it's a box with curved plot. So uh, this is the interquartile range of welfare, bilateral welfare exposure in a given year. 
And the outer uh, extended lines shows the fifth and ninety fifth uh, uh, in fifth and ninety fifth percentile in terms of welfare ex exposure. Exposure on average is increasing over time, but the dispersion is also increasing over over time. And to uh, respond to Dan's uh, uh, question, uh, there's a lot of negative entries. So in particular, in every year, the fifth percentile is negative, even though the average is positive, okay? And this is computed using Eden Cordum. This is not even the Mata industry version. Third, we're gonna show sort of how US, uh, sorry, how Chinese productivity growth affect US, Germany, and Japan, okay? On the left, we show uh, income exposure. On the right is welfare exposure. Welfare exposure is increasingly positive for all countries. In terms of income, Chinese growth benefit Japanese income, hurts relatively US and Germany. Um, it will be a robust feature that Chinese growth is always, has always been good for US welfare and bad for income throughout the sample period. But it's also true that if you look at the relative effects, so how does growth in China affect relative standing of U.S. among all countries excluding China? Chinese growth always hurts U.S. relative standing in terms of both income and welfare, especially after the WTO. Okay, so depending on your social welfare function or your view of, about the welfare function that politicians should hold, this is a set of descriptive results that would help, help you or inform you about ex economic exposure between the US and China. This is the visualization of global trade network where what we do is we take that global uh, bilateral exposure matrix and run a clustering algorithm to maximize modularity score. Basically, we don't tell the algorithm how many clusters. What the algorithm does is to separate countries into communities to maximize uh, bilateral exposure within community and minimize bilateral exposure across communities. So in the 70s, you know, you see US and, uh, and Germany and Great Britain at the center, okay? Over time in, 1980, in 1980s, you know, this is an Asian cluster, uh, European cluster and so on. And you see the rise of Japan. Fast forward to 2000, emergence of an European network, American, uh, North and South American network and an Asian network centered around Japan. So this is saying Japan is increasingly exerting positive welfare exposure to nearby countries, but relatively you know, far from the other clusters. And in, two th in 2012, the last year of our data, China basically displaced, um, displaced Japan as the, as the center of Asian network, but also because bigger than the US in terms of welfare exposure. So, so this is saying 1% increase in Chinese productivity would benefit other countries more in a weighted sense than a uh, productivity gain in US would, okay? Now that's a global clustering of different countries. We can zoom into various regional clusters. So we're gonna showcase sort of North America, Asia, and Europe. So what we do here is take the three NAFTA countries, US, Mexico, Canada, including and, and add Japan and, and China, the width of an arrow here captures the productivity or welfare exposure of, say, US, uh, US productivity to Canada. So you can see that over time, you know, uh, within NAFTA, the NAFTA countries are more well integrated and China is kind of getting bigger and taking over Japan in exerting its influence outside. Welfare exposure within the Asian countries, the most salient fact is Singapore, from a big receiver of welfare, you know, other countries' productivity all benefit Singapore in 1970. In 2012, Singapore and Thailand grew the, in their influence and China kind of displaced Japan as the center of Asia. So we do sort of regional clusters for, for a few other case studies. This is a decomposition to show how important is each third country in shaping US-China exposure, okay? so. Singapore, uh, Canada, Japan, and Malaysia are the important countries. A country is important if US derives lots of income from that country and that country buys a lot from China. Okay. In terms of industry exposures, Chinese productivity growth would hurt these industries in the US relative to these industries in, in the US. So it would relatively benefit 
more, um, say, medical equipment, transportation equipment, but displace U.S. more in textile communication equipment, office equipment, and so on. Okay. The last bit of the descriptive part is an interesting um, discovery that if you think about Chinese productivity growth on different industries in different countries, okay, if you look at countries in Asia, these factory Asia all benefit through regional production chains so that productivity gain in China, even though it's a uniform productivity that benefits all industries in China, through regional production chain, it benefits sort of the electrical, medical uh, equipment sectors in nearby countries, and it harms the textile office communication equipment in nearby countries. That's factory Asia. If you look for, if you look at countries that are resource rich, okay, the set of the set of industries that benefit are actually more of the resource or the primary industries. So this is saying a uniform productivity gain in China that benefits all sectors would actually cause a relative expansion in basic metal, mining, and petroleum in these resource-rich exporting countries and a decline or a shrinkage in their manufacturing just because of comparative advantage of these countries. Okay, so this is a general equilibrium version of Dutch disease. So we can separate out into partial and general equilibrium effects. Michael, how much time do I have? I see three minutes or so. Sorry, one minute. Okay. I am going to talk about this last bit where we basically regress political distance between countries on wealth exposures, where by political distance, we measure how countries vote in the UN, how similar are their voting behavior or we estimate an ideal point in country stance vis-a-vis -vis the US-led liberal uh, world order, how far apart are they? And we use some kind of strategic rivalry indicators categorized by political scientists that categorize countries into rivalries. So based on contemporary perception by decision makers, countries are rivalries if they're competitors or threats or enemies. So US-China is categorized as, riv as rivals now so, so is Pakistan, India, and so on. Now, in these regressions, we control for bilateral pair fixed effects and time fixed effects. So there is a differences in difference interpretation. And we also do sort of country year fixed effect as well in some of the specifications. So essentially, we're looking within country pair across time, how does changes in trade exposure or welfare exposures to trade affect political distance? Of course, there could be reverse causality. Right, so something that affects political exposure could, could actually cause changes in trade relationship that increase their welfare exposure. So what we do is we estimate a gravity equation and use the distance predicted trade flow to instrument for the welfare exposure. So over time within country pair, if there are changes in the relationship between trade flow and distance, if there are changes over time changes in that coefficient, that will be the predictor of uh, changes in bilateral exposure. So I'm going to show you the two-stage least square version of that. Across you know, many different specifications and different measures of bilateral exposure across different models, single sector, multi-sector input output, and so on, and different political outcomes, as countries become closer or greater friends or economic friends within country pair over time, as they become greater economic friends, they also vote more similarly. They appear to have smaller distance in their ideal points. And finally, they're less likely to engage in strategic rivalries. Okay. So to conclude, this paper develops a bilateral matrix representation of global exposure to each other's productivity shocks. We focus on productivity shocks, but we can show, you know, extend this to trade cost shocks and various other things. It holds in ACR class of models, but also a broader class of models, say trading balance and so on. And uh, we, we conduct various empirical application to use th these methodologies to understand the changing landscape of global uh, trade flows. The approximation is basically exact. So if you want to run counterfactuals based on productivities on welfare, using nonlinear uh, head algebra, you essentially get the same number, but 70,000 times slower. And finally, our, num uh, our, our analysis shows that as countries become greater economic friends, 
they are also closer in the political in terms of political distance. That's it. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ernest. So uh, again, we have a few minutes uh, uh, for break. Uh, and during the break, if you want to ask Ernest questions, please feel free to do so. Uh, we're going to come back in uh, four or five minutes. So, any hey, questions? Ernest, I, I, I had a question, Ernest. Um, how do, can you interpret the magnitude of those regressions of the political distance? Or is there any interpretation? There should be. We don't have it yet. Um, yeah, we. I, I don't have the answer. I think the issue lies in how to interpret um, the welfare exposure because what we are measuring is kind of an elasticity measure. So what's the elasticity of a country's welfare through general equilibrium on 1% productivity change? So we haven't decided, you know, we, we might need to convert that into something more interpretable. Uh, right now, we don't have a structural interpretation of the magnitude. I have a related question. Um, so do you try to run these regressions with income exposure? Because as you know, people are more aware of their income losses rather than of their worker benefits. Yeah, so um, income exposure on, on these results are more sensitive. You know, some are have the right sign, but insignificant and so on. We also have a third data source um, based on citizen survey. So the Pew Research Center conducts surveys around the world. So they, they go to Iran and ask, what, what's your view on China? What's your view on, on the US and so on? So the income exposure is not very predictive of political uh, or of political distance measured by political decision makers. So countries don't get closer in terms of their UN voting or strategic rivalry by income exposure. However, citizen surveys are more responsive to income exposure than welfare. So it kind of makes sense that citizens are, you know, income is more salient to their, to, uh, income is more salient to citizens, but welfare should be what political decision makers care about. We are sort of um, refining that part and we're going to add that to the paper. We, we don't have that yet, so I'm not presenting it. Nice. Uh, I have a related question if we still have time. Uh, so, obviously, you are using EK, uh, which assumes perfect competition. And when you show all these graphs about mining and petroleum, I started thinking about markups and all this oligopoly structure. I mean, to what extent that uh, you think your um, sort of good results based on the first order condition, uh, first order approximation will be still good uh, if we sort of incorporate more market structure into the framework? Yeah, so so first of all, ACR, net, the class of ACR models or Armington model nests the Krugman model, which has markups. So just having markup itself will change nothing about uh, our results. Now, if you have a model in mind where markups would vary with competition and so on, that would actually affect the trade elasticity in some sense. Because in a model with markups and production and firms, you can think of this elasticity as the sort of cross-price elasticity with, fact, with respect to factors. So rather than cross-price elasticity with respect to goods, you can think of how does Singapore consumers, how much are they spending and paying ultimately to factors in China, factors in the US and so on. And in that world, deviation from CS is certainly possible. We have some theoretical characterization of the deviation from CES. We don't have a micro-founded model to map that into a model of variable markups. That we don't do. But to the extent that you think you know, variable markups is important, give us a micro-founded model. Based on that, we can compute some cross-price elasticities. I've, my hunch's approximation will work reasonably well. Great. So I have, I have a question if we have still more time. Uh, I think I think you know this is uh, extremely uh, fascinating. I just think it might be useful to have another measure of political distance than voting in the UN. Uh, you know, because voting in the UN very often you know has some you know long-term strategic uh, issues, etc. Uh, you might look at you know basically uh, trade agreements or, or whatever. Now I understand that that's a little bit difficult because that's going to be a little bit exogenous, endogenous. Uh, 
but I think, you know, only looking at kind of, you know, voting in the UN uh, uh, may not completely uh, reflect, uh, you know, political distance. Right, so, so we, we are sort of augmenting UN voting with the strategic rivalry indicator. We're trying to bring in citizen surveys, you know, how citizens in, a, in countries uh, think of each other. The issue with citizen survey is it starts fairly recently, you know, it starts in 2005 and sample really only ramp up after 2010. So variation is limited. We're also looking at global aids from country to one country to another. You can think of say China has too much resources and want to improve productivity of some other country, which country should China invest in to benefit itself the most? Uh, we are looking into those data sources, but the data quality of international relations in general is not great. So um, if you have other suggestions on that, I would like to talk to you offline about that. <laughs>